back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and today I am joined with a very special guest, Mr. Joseph Atwell. At will? How do I? At will, yes. At will, okay. Um, author of Caesar's Messiah, available in the description. As always, please, please check that out. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Let everyone know who you are. Yeah, fresh uh, face sure. on the channel. Um, well, I uh, am an author. I've uh, written uh, two, uh, probably the best known books are my book on um, sort of Christian origins and uh, kind of the interpretation of the Gospels that is as a typological prefiguration. Uh, it's uh, called Caesar's Messiah, the Roman Invention of Jesus. And I have also have written a book on Shakespeare, which is related to the first book. Uh, called Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, which um, has to do with the um, both the authorship question of the literature and also the meaning of the plays. And I use uh, or present the idea that um, the interpretation of the Gospels that I give is actually mirrored and understood by the author of the Shakespearean literature. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've certainly have done um, you know, many lectures and uh, um, podcasts on on the subject. Always happy to do. I uh, did not specifically study, particularly in college, um, anything regarding uh, the New Testament, um, but was uh, uh, a student uh, in uh, of, of a uh, military academy, a, a Christian Brothers Catholic Military Academy when I was young. And so there it was it was in Japan following World War II. Um, I had quite a bit of uh, sort of training in, in in the Gospels. That was the primary subject. And so um, even though I eventually sort of fell away for no particular reason, just as people sometimes do, I always retained an interest in Jesus. And then later, uh, following sort of the <clears throat> my life in business. Um, where I'd, I'd been in, involved with uh, software, um, I had the time and uh, had, you know, was sort of interested in one particular question, which was, um, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls that I'd been reading, uh, you know, are, present the, a messianic movement, which is at roughly the same time as Christianity purports its origins. Sure. But but that messianic movement was militaristic and yep. totally opposed to Rome. And so the question I had, which was just such a kind of an obvious one, is how did, <laughs> these, two, how did these two groups get along? How, how could they have coexisted in such a, a tiny area at approximately the same time in history and perhaps actually overlapped one another? Um, and why don't they mention one another? Um, there, so I was, that was sort of the curiosity that I had and um, in order to really understand the first century in Judea, there's really only one you know, primary document you can read, and that's the histories of Josephus. Sure. Um, and so I read them, and uh, during the reading of them, I noticed what I saw were sort of unusual parallels to the gospel story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and many of them had been noticed by scholars before me. Um, and I was trying to understand why Josephus would create these parallels. And the first theory I had was that he was mocking Christianity, that he was aware of the Gospels and that these were, you know, sort of a sinister mockery of, of the literature. Um, and eventually that was all I was really studying. I, I had left my first interest and I was just, you know, very much interested in the parallels that uh, existed between Josephus and the Gospels. And then one day, for no particular reason, I had the insight that we know all of the parallels that I'm seeing, and at that time I was probably studying like 20 of them, they're occurring in the same sequence in both uh, works of literature. Wow. And at that point, I realized that, you know, there was a, this was actually a deliberate genre. And then I was able from that point to make sense of of the Gospels um, in, that they had been produced by the Flavian court um, and are a kind of prefiguration typology, which is to say that 
the story of Jesus, it was written, created um, from the history of the uh, military campaign of Titus Flavius. And it is, an, it is looking forward 40 years from the time that the story of Jesus purportedly occurs. And this was all this this fictional typology was all done to basically show the identity of the Son of Man that Jesus is envisioning sure. um, that will come in 40 years. And so the Gospels are, even though they, you know, on the surface, our, our religious literature and certainly operated as that, really they were created as a kind of a vanity piece for the Caesars. This mm. this is why the this complicated typology was inserted into the Gospels. There's no there was no particular reason, no, no theological reason to do this. Um, but if you drive around Rome, walk around the city, you'll see there are hundreds of monuments which proclaim the divinity of Caesars. Oh, sure. Um, and so this is really what the Gospels are. They are a kind of literary version of the Arch of Titus, uh, wherein you have you know, the events that Jesus was predicting would occur represented, you know, the temple is destroyed and looted. And um, Vespasian and Titus are stated to be uh, God and the son of God. <laughs> so right, right. <laughs> so that, there, there is the uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the, the framework uh, from which the literature came was just, you know, their understanding of themselves as divine they knew that the jews had um believed that a messiah would come and that this was what propelled them to rebel and so the the gospels were written to show that actually um these prophecies uh you know that uh, were contained in the jewish literature uh in fact envisioned the roman caesar that the son of man that jesus envisions is in fact caesar and if you read Josephus carefully, you can see he actually states the exact same position that sure. um, what most propelled the Jews to rebel was the fact that they believed that one from their race would come and be, rule the world. These are the Messianic prophecies. So, so um, the, um, the way to understand the Gospels is contained in the very first pages of, of the literature, the Gospel of Matthew. And it is the um, prefiguration typology that the author created to link Moses to Jesus. Mm. Now, everyone who is familiar with the history of Jesus or the purported history will know that, you know, in Matthew, you have the Joseph, you know, having dreams, he's supposed to leave, right, uh, right. travels from Israel to Judea. Um, the um, at, at a certain point, um, you know, you have the massacre of the innocents, mm -hmm. but then a divine personage comes and tells an angel, comes and says, you know, they are dead who sought the, the child's life. He then returns, um, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, or Jesus returns to, uh, to Israel and has the baptism, you know, followed which by he um, goes into the wilderness and has the three, um, you know, you know, he's there for 40 days and he has the three events uh, right, with right. Satan that are related to his sort of theological position uh, to divinity. Well, where does that story come from? <clears throat> if you simply are familiar, you know, with uh, the story of Exodus, you know that these have, these are all representations of these events. Joseph dreams, dreams, goes to Israel. Mm -hmm. A divine personage comes and says, now the people who sought your, the child's life are dead. You return, you go, you have a baptism. Now, the baptism is really sort of critical. I'm going to return to it as soon as I get done with this little rant. But anyway, then, um, uh, you know, Moses goes into the wilderness for 40 years, not 40 days like Jesus does. Typology is not verbatimism. You know, it right. has to have slight differences, <laughs> right. but it also has to have enough similarities so people can pick up on it. Sure. And then Moses has the, uh, the three, basically the temptations of the Israelites. Um, and the, the, the statements that Jesus makes are quoted. They're not, they're not um, you know, uh, a speculation. These are literal quotes from uh, the story of, of Exodus, and they're inserted sure. into the, you know, the story of Jesus. So 
how do you know, you know, what is really the thing that holds the two stories together? Well, it's the sequence. Mm -hmm. So sequence is a very important and powerful part of typologic coherency. Um, it, it is, you know, it helps the writer because typology, particularly in religious literature, is, is you know, usually divine writing. You're talking about a divine hand and at play. Right. And so sequence is something that the author doesn't really have to write about. It just exists underneath the, the words, in fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the le and the reader is supposed to have enough ability, reading ability, to recognize it. And so, in Matthew, you have you know this the story of Moses used as the, the basis for all of Jesus's pre ministry. Particularly interesting is the baptism um, because it is so abstract, so obtuse. You would never notice that the two stories have any kind of typologic linkage. Um, if you weren't looking at the stories in sequence, and then you would notice that it both at that point in time or at that point in, within the sequence, you have um, a passage through water. And mm -hmm. then the author of Matthew also <clears throat> underlines it because it's a hard concept to, to see. He quotes um, a line from Exodus in, in the story of Jesus's baptism about, uh, you know, out of Israel, I've called my son. Right. And so you, you now have a prefiguration of Jesus Christ that was uh, created by the hand of God um, in in basically the life of Moses, and so that Jesus and Moses have this divine linkage, and so this was um, you know a kind of an important point the sure. author of Message is sure. making. Now, the, um, the 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 criticism I have of the basic criticism I have of uh, New Testament scholarship is that it studies things, you know, kind of well and intently, though often it goes off into sort of incoherent directions like the, you know, the, the kind of the uh, authorship of uh, the primacy question about who wrote first, who copied from him. I mean, that's just a puzzle box of insanity. It's never going to be solved because it, 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 it's not a real question. It just seems to be. Right. But, but what really they are not, focused on is simply sequence that sequence can have meaning sure. just like it had meaning in the relationship between you know jesus's pre-ministry and moses's exodus story yeah if yeah. they would just spend <clears throat> a few hours uh and i i would just ask every new testament scholar out there to just simply do this <laughs> just spend a few hours considering how sequence um might have a meaning in the uh in in the story of jesus oh sure sure and if, if they would do that what they would immediately see is that there are many events that are occurring in the same order and i would just some yeah. of them are historical events which are not in any way controversial things like encircling jerusalem with the wall the raising of the temple the abomination of desolation okay so or even the journey from uh, from uh, galilee to to jerusalem mm -hmm. These right. are just, you know, historical events which are uh, obvious, uh, and and the the literature is showing in in the same order. Well, once you have that as a structure, then the more abstract um, parallels, and some of them are incredibly abstract. They they take a lot of time to sort of understand what the how they are connected, um, sure. but they all start to come into understanding and focus once you have the sequence laid out. And and what I have said is that, you know, people will sometimes to um, to try to, you know, debate me on Caesar's Messiah. What what they would typically do or often do is to they will go to the most abstract parallel that I present and then try to show that if isolated and analyzed, you can see it in other ways than the ones that I present. And of course, they are right, but. It is also correct that this has nothing to do with what I'm <laughs> right. talking about. Sure. Um, because what I what I've said is, look, forget that. Just do this. Just take the historically the same things, like the you know the destruction of the temple or the encircling of the city with the wall, and then add to that the parallels that have been discussed by many other New Testament scholars, because there's a whole collection of them, right, mm -hmm. that right. have been discussed. 
and then just place those things into sequence and you'll see uh, what what is the basis for the story of Jesus. So sure, this is, um, uh, you know, kind of kind of where um, uh, the, the the position of Caesar's Messiah is at this mm-hmm. point is that it's, mm-hmm. it's been an amazingly popular book relative to, you know, the standards of New Testament sales. I mean, 100,000 copies or more. Um, so it's been very popular. Uh, there's been a movie made that millions and millions of people have watched. So it's, you know, I've been very happy with the um, reception. Um, but for it to, um, you know, to really become the understanding uh, of of uh, the origins of Christianity and to have impact on the religion, you need to have uh, New Testament scholarship go through the process I just outlined, that they would need to sure. uh, just take the time um, and, and they could do this irrespective of my analysis. I, I often say, don't don't even read the book. Oh, it most will, definitely. It will, be, it will prejudice you to. Yeah, to sure, sure. Just do the yeah. process that I've asked. Just, just understand sequence as an element of prefiguration typology. And <clears throat> I've done this actually with a few scholars and they actually are able to list. They, they know these parallels, <laughs> but yeah. they just have not ever yeah. bothered to to go through the process of trying to, sh- to, to, to see what, what meaning sequence has. And so this is um, what I hope that um, occurs going forward, because uh, I, I think it's a, you know, it's a bad idea to have a religion, um, you know, basically created by oligarchs that uh, yeah. right. you know, we use as our foundation. And so I would like to see, um, uh, you know, honest, criticism of it, um, you know, based on this, this approach. Right. Yeah. And to, to reinforce that point of how important, uh, the sequential writing of the events is and how it's portrayed in that way. I did a video on my channel. I'm sure the viewers are probably familiar with it. It's called copycat Jesus. Mm -hmm. It actually goes through, um, the Moses, the Exodus events, as you had just mentioned, but also um, Elijah's ministry and how his miracles are, yes, yes. are um, yeah, yeah. re-performed by Jesus in a more extravagant way, and how both of their ministries, uh, Moses and Elijah, more or less culminate with a mountain experience. You then have the mountain of transfiguration for Jesus and who shows up but Elijah and Moses. So once again, you're seeing sequential sequential um miracles and things that are basically being recycled that uh the reader should already understand um and it's very similar with with this caesar's messiah premise and i'm i'm sure you're familiar with uh dr dennis mcdonald i've had him on the show sure a couple times um and we go over the same thing with the greek epics you know and we know we know rome really absorbed greek culture and we're enamored by it. So seeing all these things coming together, you're really finding sophisticated literature, right? Yeah, not just, for sure. Not yeah. just some, not just some ignorant fisherman from the Galilee. <laughs> you know, this yeah, is, and, and the thought world of the authors is not, um, they're not peasants. They're they're very sophisticated um, literary experts, and their thought world, much of it resides. Uh, you know, in in the, the educational background of the patrician class, which of course includes you know the Odyssey, things like that. So uh, McDonald, I think, does a pretty good job of showing you know that as the basis for some of the stories. Um, and and there are actually others that that I I saw um, you know particularly relating to Julius Caesar. And mm-hmm. at some point, I might bring out a, another book which uh, would you know show this Julius Caesar typology, but uh, Caesar's Messiah is actually an incomplete book. Um, mm. It is basically the analysis I thought would be most useful for people. Sure. Um, uh, if and and it's also the easiest for me to discuss because if you go into really because these guys really are um, uh, you know I wouldn't call them geniuses but they love complex literary right right puzzles and things. And to go into the more complicated ones, um, and I do a, just a small bit of it in in Caesar Messiah, um, just to show that that level exists. But 
I knew that if I brought this out, that that would be all I'd ever be talking about for the rest of my life, because these things are so complicated. And, you know, there would be, um, uh, you know, there would be people who would want to dispute them. And and because they are complicated, the these exchanges could last you know, infinite amount of time. So what yeah. you have <laughs> is and, it, and it's also what I brought out, I think, is actually um, what the uh, authors wanted it. This is the, it's a building block. Uh, the letters of Paul are related to this. Sure. And sure. I go into it uh, to my take on that in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah. But I point out the the letters of Paul are not meant for someone who doesn't understand the prefiguration typology in, in the Gospels. You'll never make any sense mm -hmm. of, you won't mm -hmm. see the deep level, the the kind of puzzles. And, and I mean, there's some aspects of the Pauline letters that people will get, but it's built upon an understanding of the um, of the Flavian uh, typology in the Gospels, and the same thing is true with um, uh, with Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, the, the Shakespearean literature. Um, you know, I I use the uh, one of the plays I use is Titus Andronicus, which is just oh. a straightforward sure. kind of a spoof of the Flavian typology in the Gospels, and I use that play because it's just so obvious if you've read Caesar's Messiah that the author of, of Shakespeare knows it, uh, knows the Flavian typology and is making fun of it. So, but it is a building block. I mean, no Shakespearean scholar would ever have an insight into what the play meant or what the humor is without the first understanding the Flavian uh, typology. So that building block approach is throughout all of the, the literature. And it really starts right off the bat with the Gospel of, of Matthew. Um, and the uh, pre pre ministry typology that I discussed, um, that took me. Um, it's kind of funny. I I went backwards to be able to solve that. I'd already done a lot of the kind of adult ministry analysis, and um, then tried to make sense of the beginning, the pre ministry, and it took me quite a while to actually understand that that was uh, sorry Moses, but. If I'd been a better student, I would have known that this has already been understood and discovered by, you know, but it was just actually a, a part of of some aspect of New Testament scholarship. Uh, mm -hmm. Goulder had talked about this at the beginning of the, uh, you know, the, of the 20th century, for heaven's sake. So um, anyway, you need that that basic approach, that that approach of, you know, one step at a time. Right. Um, and anyway, so. In in the uh, I, I have a, a chapter called the Flavian signature, which just outlines the uh, uh, the parallels between uh, uh, Jesus and um, uh, the military campaign, which are intended, uh, you know, by the authors of the gospel to be comprehensible. There there are more of them than the ones I present, but these are just ones I give to show that to really what I'm trying to do there, Steve, is just to show the power of sequence. Yeah. Because yeah. once you go through that, you see the 50 parallels and you can say, well, these are a few of them may be just my imagination, but so many of them are just so completely obvious once you lay them side by side that the, you can see that the basis for Jesus's ministry is the military campaign of Titus Slavius. And that that fact answers the question as to the identity of the Son of Man that Jesus is predicting. So. Right. And you do you do see in Josephus in his writings also that um, almost an admission that the the Flavians, Vespasian and Titus are these messianic type figures. Um, yeah. So yeah, of course, one yeah. question I normally get um, with people that, you know, are against the Roman providence theory and and this this type of this side of scholarship right um is you know what's the motivation why would the romans need to invent a religion um and you brought up paul and i think that's a very important point is well if you just open up your own bible the romans have their own book right and and paul is real he's greeting people from caesar's household he's got his own little apartment right there on the palatine hill right um he's, yeah, he's, he's very close with the herod family he, yeah, related yeah. to the Herodian yeah, family. He knows um, them, you know, kinsmen. Yeah. Romans 13, he's saying, listen to the Romans, they're God's chosen rulers. 
Uh, if you disobey the Romans, you know, you're going to have to face God's wrath for it. These type of things, I mean, that's that's very uncanny for for a people who are about to destroy your temple. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's completely incoherent um, from the historical perspective. Where where does this character come from as a supposedly religious Jew? Um, even the character of Jesus Christ makes no sense, frankly, historically. At that time in Judea, there was already uh, this whole problem of Roman colonialization and their insertion into the Jewish religion. I mean, why in the world would uh, a son of David, a uh, Messiah, um, tell the people to turn the other cheek and to carry the Roman soldiers' backpacks? I mean, this right. It, it just I mean, now. Now, of course, people would say, well, because he was divine, he had this this uh, special meaning to humanity. Well. Okay, but nevertheless, it is historically illogical. It has to be admitted. And of course, it raises the question as to, well, where does the literature come from? Um, sure. You know, what there there is this other possibility that the literature is just operating as propaganda. And, yeah. and so, you know, that that's really the um, following the war, uh, the, the the war that is referenced in the Gospels is the uh, the war between uh, Rome and uh, and the uh, zealots that occurred between 66 and 73. Um, and so following the war, um, the, uh, uh, the, the Roman you know, patrician class realized that even though they'd won this particular round, that the, um, the actual struggle with uh, Judaism was gonna go forward. They hadn't destroyed the Messianic movement. Um, and the war that that is referenced uh, actually was the that particular chapter started at the year one or thereabouts with Judas the Galilean. That was the first yeah. rebellion, religious rebellion that Josephus referenced. So the religious rebellions had been going on for 70 years there around uh, following the Roman colonialization of Judea. And if, if one, I can just pause you for one second before yeah, I lose the, before I forget this question. Do, do you think the render unto Caesar, that which is Caesar's, is basically polemical against another Judas the Galilean type uprising as taxation and money was such a major issue? Oh, it's such a good question. You know, the answer is I don't really know. Um, I would if I had to if I had to conjecture, I would say it's actually Flavian humor because of the fact that they were famous as tax collectors. Um, mm -hmm. The Flavians are the Roman Empire's most famous tax collectors. And notice that tax collectors are referenced often in, in the literature in a favorable light. So um, I, I would think it also has a kind of an arch irony to it in that the uh, authors know that when they say, you know, give to God, what is God and Caesar, what is Caesar's? Um, they're actually saying, give everything to Caesar because Caesar is God. You see, that's, yeah. that's kind of what you have to be able to deduce um, from the uh, typology that the son of man, this divine character that Jesus is referencing uh, is in fact Caesar. So it's in, you know, the, there's nothing really illogical in inside the literature. The Romans were very, very fastidious in terms of no contradictions, but it's sometimes the contradictions might seem apparent, but if you puzzle through them, you can see that the authors are finding the way to wiggle out. Wiggle out. They really do want to, uh, you know, have history record them as being rational and logical. Um, just think of the people producing the Gospels uh, as, you know, looking for legacy at some point, because this is why they, they put the typology in there, and they want to be held in high regard. Um, they are kind of psychopathic, unfortunately, in that I, I believe they, they thought that in the future, when the Gospels were eventually decoded, that the population would look at them with favor and not mm -hmm. with derision, but uh, you know, you, it's it's you, one thing you can only speculate about. Steve is the psychology of the Caesars, um, right. and how the church definitely variegated from that in declaring yeah. this the divine word of God infallible. You know, I'm sure yeah. when it was being written, it wasn't looked at that way. Yeah, and then you know the going forward in time, you know, you end up with uh, Constantine starting the process to make the religion the state religion. And it gets used um, as a, a monotheism um, to basically enforce the, um, the power of the feudal system, which is a slave system that has the Pope at the top, the emperor, 
there with him. And then, you know, you go down through a hierarchy to you get to the serf, uh, a slave, a human animal. Um, and, but he's given a kind of worker's paradise after he's dead, you know, with these ideas of joining <laughs> right. paradise. Right. And that unfortunately is 1500 years of European history. You know, that, that, oh, that yeah. just kept yeah. going on and on. And so now when we look at ourselves, we have, I think, um, uh, to some extent, been been extremely influenced by this this power, the the propaganda that the oligarchs subjected us to. Mm. It it is iterative in every generation, and it and it is still with us. And I think that uh, it makes us easier, you know, to control, to accept, um, you know, government dictums which are not in our interests, you know. And I so I think that, uh, you know, the hopefully the if Caesar's Messiah has any influence, it would be to raise skepticism uh, on the citizens of the governments, you know, that uh, we have to always um, you know, check their stories uh, for accuracy, <laughs> because uh, oftentimes th these stories are simply propaganda. Sure, sure. Another point I wanted to raise, um, and I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if this point exactly is talked about all that much. Um, but we see in the Gospel of Mark, we have this adoptionist theology, right, that God really is adopting Jesus. Mm -hmm. But then you start getting into the more mythology sides of the Gospels, and you have a divine virgin birth Messiah that uh, throughout Christian history, they, they would say, oh, well, Joseph adopted him into the house of David. Um, well, if anyone's familiar with how Judaism works, that's not how it works. But in Rome, in the imperial house— that is how it worked. Um, right. I actually had a whole show called Emperor Jesus talking about adoption throughout the Gospels and adoption in high class Rome, right? And how really a Roman emperor, more so than just his biological children, he would he would choose an heir, often not even related, or, or a nephew, or someone, one of his great generals, for example. Um, so what do you think about that? Do you think well, I think you're absolutely right? I think you you've identified the thought world where this this comes from. Um, it is, uh, as I understand the Torah, it's really not in their lineage of divinity. Certainly, um, they they are very, you know, as they represented anyway. They're very clear about the root of uh, of Jesse and the branch of David. You know, these are ge direct genetic lineages and then right. you know the, at, in, in the new testament they have lineages which are contradictory of course yeah. <laughs> and, and uh but at the same time you know you have a divine birth and then you have the concept of adoption used over and over again so it to me they're just poking at the edges of the um fundamentalism of of the jewish religion they're kind of loosening it up a little bit the the actual um and this would be in, in in Caesar's Messiah, I, I go, I, this is part of the symbolically complicated stuff that I actually do present. Um, you know, they, they spoof the, um, uh, the vegetative humor in, um, that's visible in, in uh, the Jewish literature. In other words, you know, you have the branch and the root, which are the, you know, very critical concepts to the Messiah uh, in, in, uh, in Judaism. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Gospels, you know, you have him, you have Jesus characterized as such, as, as uh, you know, the um, branch of David. But then you have this whole vegetative symbolism that kind of, it's a little hard to see, but it swirls around him. You know, he's, he's captured in the Garden of Gethsemane, which it means wine press. He's right. leaking blood like a, a grape in a press. He's given a crown of thorns, you know, like a plant. And then... Um, uh, he's put on a, a cross, right? right. <laughs> hung so, on a tree as the right, New so Testament. Hung on a tree. So, so you see, you have the the vegetative symbolism of Judaism being represented. Um, but oh, and the fig tree parable for sure. Yeah, yeah, for, you know, okay. But but then then in Josephus, they have a parallel story. They have someone captured on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus was captured, right? The Mount of Olives, another vegetative link. So. The parallel that Josephus has, he, they capture this this individual, um, and I won't go into it because it's it's complicated how how it is done, and it represent, but it does represent the individual 
as a vegetative human. He is, he is like a, a mandrake root. And then this individual is presented to Titus who, who doesn't order him crucified, but he orders him pruned, pruned. Mm -hmm. In fact, very specific biological world, Colosse, which is used in um, like Pendantius de Cordatis, uh, who is the famous Greek botanist, kind of the father of, of, of botany. And, and it's used to describe um, grafting on to a wild plant. That's, yeah. that's what you do. So, so Titus doesn't order the individual crucified, but rather pruned. <laughs> and this is, this is really critical in terms of you know, the overall structure of the Gospels. And, sure. Uh, okay, so what they're really saying is... And I'm sure that um, builds off of Paul a little, because Paul uses that exact, par that exact exactly metaphor. Exactly right, right. So in other words, you have um, the concept of a grafting on to this vegetative lineage uh, that is symbolic of the Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so you're, they're pruning this individual, and, and they're simply grafting the Caesar on to him. <laughs> You know, so to speak. <laughs> now, this is completely symbolic, but this is, but to them, it's just, it's logical because all of the literature here is symbolic. Um, the, oh, sure, uh, sure. You know, the, the, the gospels certainly are, and they, they, they understand that the histories of Josephus uh, are not a true history either. They're just writ written to be the um, counterparty to the, uh, uh, the typology in the gospels. So um, that's, that is really what we're, you know, when when you talk about the, um, you know, the the lineage that uh, the vegetative lineage that that Jesus is part of, you know, the root of of uh, Jesse, the branch of David, that this is um, uh, a actually a kind of Roman humor in a way, but it's 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 morphing the Jewish um, religious literature to prune on to graft on the new testament and sure. so that's that sure. is that is really the overview of, the, of all of the uh, of, of the meaning of, of of the new testament as we have it it's just a grafting on a roman right. grafting right. on of the literature creating of stories and it ends up with um you can uh, basically accept jesus and from him you can accept the authority of the roman magistrates the religious <laughs> bureaucrats etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah yeah, and they put they put that exact thing into the mouth of Jesus. Where, I mean, how's how's the exact verse go? I'm the I'm the tree, and you are the branches. Yeah, branches yeah. that don't produce food, I'll prune off. You know, you're right. gonna, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so they, that, that very concept is is being put right in the mouth of Jesus, and we have it in Paul, like we had mentioned before. Yeah. So it's, it's a, the, place. In the thought world of the author. In this case, it's not their thought world; it's just their symbolic meaning. Um, is repeated so that you know the alert reader can see it. And once you've, um, you know, it, it uh, as, as we discuss it, and particularly if someone's like listening to this for the first time, it might seem kind of complicated. But uh, in in Caesar's Messiah, I have the chapter of the Flavian signature, which is just all of these parallels side by side. Right. It's really all you you need to have um, to really understand that. The Romans are just basically grafting this character on to sure uh, to 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 the Jews' literature, and it's with a kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, way of representing Caesar's divinity. It's it's just right. not particularly. It's really not that complicated. It just sure as I said, without under, without trying to um, make sense of sequence, and this is just befuddling to me. I'm going to repeat this because. Sequence is so important in uh, prefiguration typology, such an obvious element. The fact that New Testament scholarship does not want to take the time to do this analysis is very, very, um, well, it's, it's damning that they won't just bother to do this because um, it's really, it, the, the religion is going to roll forward, I think, until you really do have that religion inside of uh, of scholarship. Yeah. That would be how the public would, you know, would, would kind of have the permission to make these ideas, you know, their own. Um, and I've had really good luck. I mean, the scholars that have given me blurbs uh, for the book are, I think, among the very best in, in the world. But it's it's very difficult to get um, 
New Testament scholars who have published material to uh, even consider the possibility of another right. know, framework because I mean let's face it once once they have come out with a you know <laughs> an, an explanation of they, you know, they don't like to they, admit they're they, wrong they, yeah, they cannot, <laughs> yeah so there you are but uh, anyway it's um uh, so it's uh we're in a difficult transition point I think sure. for the religion so yeah most certainly um one final point uh yeah. as well. We're just over 40 minutes, so one point, one final point that I'd like to discuss is um, how do you feel about this really being literature? You know, Jesus is the it's the religion of love. You know what I mean? Do you do you think it was truly intended as a tactic to pacify Jewish messianism? Like your Messiah is actually a loving, a loving pacifist uh, figure, not this warlike figurehead that you're understanding absolutely that is absolutely the the gospels have two two aspects you know one is political and one is vanity i've, I've discussed the vanity the political aspect is just to neuter um the messianic movement joseph has mentioned that what the romans were afraid of was was not just judea but they're afraid of the messianic rebellion spreading throughout the empire and right. so what they're really doing with this literature was trying to put a uh, a break to it, a, you know, a counterweight so that uh, the Jews who might be susceptible to the Messianic fervor, you know, that that uh, the, the Dead Sea Scroll community had, had, had was experiencing, that they would pause and, uh, and particularly if the Roman, you know, uh, imperial cult was producing priests that were spreading this information that this would slow down the Messianic movement. And amazingly, it just failed completely. Um, the, the two rebellions were, you know, Messianic. Uh, one occurred in like 115, 113, the Kiddus Rebellion. And then you had the famous Bar Kokhba Rebellion in 133 uh, that led to the diaspora. But the, the rebellion in 115 is the most important one. It's the one that I think people should really look at in terms of what was the political purpose of the gospel because the rebellion occurred way outside of Judea. It, it occurred in Cyrenia uh, mm. and, and in Egypt. The Jews of these areas um, were had fallen victim, <laughs> to use an expression, of the Messianic fervor, and they rebelled. Now, this rebellion is not well known to history, but you know people can just use Wikipedia to see how catastrophic it was. Uh, the Jews got control of the island of Cyprus, I believe, and they depopulated it of Gentiles. Uh, the Roman historians claim that there were a quarter million Gentiles slaughtered. The, um, the Messianic movement got c completely depopulated the area of uh, what is now Libya. It had to be repopulated following the rebellion. And there's actually a letter that was found from a Roman magistrate that was trying to escape from the Jews go by going down the Nile. He was heading uh, south, trying to get away from Alexandria. Now, this is extraordinary because, I mean, Egypt is the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. The mm -hmm. idea they would lose control of it uh, is would be catastrophic, and yet they did. So you can see that the potential for Jewish rebellion was really ominous to right. the Romans uh, leading up to the beginning of the second century. The Roman patrician class knew that that power existed. They knew that the Messianic fervor could, could arise. It already had done so many times. And then when it exploded in 115, it was just, it was the most bloody war that the Romans had ever experienced. And then yet, even though they had defeated uh, the Jews again for a second time, they popped back up just 15 years later with the Bar Kokhba rebellion, again, another empire-wide bloodbath. So um, this was the political purpose and why you have the, uh, the characterization of the Messiah as the Messiah of love. It's yep. to address that specific problem uh, that Josephus recorded, that what was propelling the Jews to rebel was their belief that one from their race would come and lead them against the Romans and then they could rule the world. And so 
and and it's very logical to the religion because remember David was given the power of God. Right? Oh sure. Okay, so they were assuming that another Messiah would appear who would also have the power of God and with such power you could defeat the Romans. So this was the um you know why the the character Jesus was you know developed as being the, the uh, prince of love and um you know, and so this, of course, makes it very difficult to um, uh, criticize the religion at this point because so much of, you know, the ad advance of our humanity is linked into, particularly Europeans, is linked into Christianity. And uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's as if we're criticizing, uh, you know, love itself when you when you criticize the, the origins of Jesus. But unfortunately, um, everything good can be used for evil purposes and oh, in sure. this instance uh, the oligarchs they just came up with a fantastic propaganda idea uh, and it was very successful in the dark ages yeah 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 and it would seem to me that this this literature wouldn't have necessarily been directed at learned jews they would have known it was bunk right off the bat, but more to a, a Roman mind, right? Exactly. A, a Greco-Roman mind. It was, it was, in fact, it was written for anyone who might have been susceptible to the Jewish missionary activity, including Gentiles. And of course, Greek was the lingua franca of the era sure. for the common people. And so this was, this was why it was produced in Greek. And um, they wanted to, you know, have it as widely understood as possible, but I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, how many copies of the thing could they have produced? It's just so difficult to um, to write this material, you know, with the technology they had. I think Constantine, when he was going to make it the state religion, is claimed to have produced 30 copies, right? 30 copies. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, during the Flavian era, they would never, they wouldn't have bothered with that. What, what would have occurred is just the, the priests of the imperial cult, which was the largest bureaucracy in the, in the Roman Empire, they would have just been encouraged to tell the story of Jesus. Right, they right. Been, you know, yeah. talking which would, about Jesus. Yeah. Which would really make sense when we see, you know, just the, the issues between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, we could understand that, you know, perhaps there was some type of, I guess you could say, proto-gospel. and. Yeah. And orally, this was being transmitted to different communities, and people said, you know, maybe we should write this down. And then amidst, you know, years and years and years of redaction and and, and all this, you finally have what you have now. Um, you know, the process is uh, it, obviously absent an archaeologic miracle. We won't know, that, you know, exactly how, how the Gospels were developed, you know, one from the other. But um, they were... However, they were created. They were eventually edited into a form, which, in in none of their cases, contradicts the basic typology. The Synoptic Gospels, right, right. Mm -hmm. Even though the stories are different, the elements that are typologically related into Titus's campaign are not in contradictory sequential positions. So, someone edited these things at some point in time maybe Constantine or his working group, you know, who knows uh, how they were eventually put into this form. It wouldn't have surprised me, it wouldn't surprise me if the original version, the proto-gospel was simply a story of Jesus and, and the story of uh, Titus's campaign. And in that, in that construction, you, you could not have fooled, you know, most, alert readers because the typology would just be too vivid. Yeah. I think one of the reasons that they ended up with the three synoptics is because it just makes it hard for a reader to, you know, think back to the events in, in Josephus that are being, you know, presented because you just read through the gospels sequentially and then what does your memory come up with when you then you go to Josephus, you know? So it's um uh you know the the in fact, th this would be very interesting eventually to try to go through and figure it out, because I'm sure it could be, you know, you could come up with a general idea of how it was done. Um, I am convinced, though, that the original version would have been a laugh riot. 
it would have been mainly comic uh, when you have all of these. I mean, as I would say, if you want to look what, what it would look like, just look at the uh, Flavian signature chapter where I have all of the parallels. It doesn't matter which gospel they occur in. I just show where they are in terms. I mean, I actually use the gospel of Luke uh, for the template. But then I add in a few things just to show how the overall construction occurs. And I mean, it basically, Steve, it's it's a I, I mean, it's humorous. You know, <laughs> I mean, a, yeah. an alert reader would go through this and go, wait a second. I can see what's going on here. Um, and then once you see it as humor, then a lot of the kind of deep spiritual meanings uh, start to take on a kind of a dark comic you know sure, reality sure. you know because it's a double entente and you can see that the authors had you know a sinister comic point in mind with a lot of these stories wow yeah it's it's incredible um i've i quickly fell in love with the book but it's it's you know it's it's quite a work it's like you said there are things that are complicated and definitely take some teasing out but when you when you really take the time to dig into this stuff, it's it's uncanny. Like I said, it's just uncanny. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'm right. Um, and you know, it's it's sad in a, in a lot of ways because, um, uh, you know, as someone who's raised a Catholic and I have like priests in my immediate family, um, you know, it's a very difficult process in in many cases, particularly for individuals who are um, in 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 the faith. Um, yeah. I would almost say it's probably for individual like that. It's not even worthwhile to read the book. The people who really get a lot of value out of it are people who have, who have kind of got to the point where I was, where you're really interested in the history of the religion and how the religion, right. how the right. literature is structured and mm -hmm. how the theolo theology came about. I mean, someone in, of that, you know, kind of position, I think it, the book can make a lot of sense. I've, I've had a, many people have told me that they, you know, basically had to do a review of their faith, uh, who who were religious, you know, and then heard about the book, read it, and then had a difficult experience with it. Um, and and to those people, I can only say, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, what can I tell you other than that? This I think is is a way that um, no no one really should read the Gospels. And then not try to link up these events to the uh, um, the story that Josephus gives. I, I just think it's it's just too much of a uh, of an obvious process because there are things in in the history of, of uh, that Jesus purports to have, which are straight from Josephus. I mean, encircling Jerusalem, the temple being raised, and since there are historical events, then we really, Steve, we really should go through the whole thing and just try to get a understanding Definitely. of the gospels from that perspective Definitely. yeah for sure yeah it's it's so clear that the the worldview isn't necessarily what you know most would say it is and i think you know you were, you were talking about why scholarship doesn't really take the time to get into this and then from my outside looking in point of view i truly think a lot of it comes down to because it flips it flips the whole realm of scholarship on its head you know, sure. and oh, uh, horrible. They, they just and, I, and I'm I'm I, I'm sorry to have done this. I didn't intend to do it. When I was starting out my research. Um, a lot of these people have very difficult circumstances. New Testament scholarship is a low resource environment. There are not a lot of jobs. There's not a lot of uh, income. And so I've, I've experienced quite a bit of jealousy because, you know, my book was popular and, you know, the documentary was so popular. But there's just nothing I can do. I mean, um, it's it is it, it's going to be. I think over the next couple hundred years, this will all eventually unravel. But it's going to be very hard among not for people of faith and also for people who make their living from New Testament scholarship. Um, it's not going to be an easy process. I'm sorry. Sure. But Joseph Atwell, everybody, so glad to have had you on, man. This was truly a pleasure. Uh -huh. uh, no, no. Thank you, so Steve. Really want to appreciate. And I just want to say, um, you know, happy to come back anytime. If if there are criticisms and questions, I'm I'm will be happy to come on and do my best to address them. So thank you for having me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So with with that said, if if you have a question for 
If you have a question for Mr. Atwell, please drop a comment. However, um, yeah. I'll, we I'll gladly address, any, any send an email. Yep. Yeah, send us an email. However you want to do this, um, you guys can always find me on Facebook, email, you, you got it. Um, and yeah, I would, I would love to have you back on. Uh, it would, it would okay, well, be good. my let's, honor. I'm, let's I'm do it. Let's do thrilled it. to finally do this. Thank uh, you, Steve. Thank you for the, for the.